The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This is Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw Dating, preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys, and broadcasting live from Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. I'm Jess Navarro, joined alongside Aisha Morrison and Christy Scales here on this Wednesday afternoon here at the beautiful Star in Frisco. Some rain, a little bit of a drizzle, some clouds, and it's actually feeling a little bit like fall uh, over here in Frisco. So, dare I say it? Dare I say it? No. It's pumpkin season officially, so... Uh, I hope everybody gets a celebratory pumpkin spice latte because it feels a little more like fall outside. But um, as far as all things Dallas Cowboys, Cowboys had a walkthrough practice today and we got the injury report. So I wanted to start off with that because I know there's some panic going on on social media. So here we are to alleviate the panic for you guys. Starting with wide receiver Brandon Cooks, he did not participate today with a knee injury. Tyler Smith, hamstring injury, also did not participate. Donovan Wilson still dealing with that calf injury, also not participating. And Tyron Smith, ankle was a full go. Again, it is important to note that it was a walkthrough today once again. Just wanted to remind you of that. And Christy, we just heard from Mike McCarthy in a press conference today that talked a little bit about it. What was your biggest takeaways from what he said about all of these guys as far as injuries and possible returns? That they're hopeful that Donovan Wilson may actually get some in-practice work tomorrow when Mm -hmm. they have a real practice and not just a a walkthrough, or as McCarthy called it, a (laughs) jog-through this afternoon, but it's a walkthrough. So I think that's promising, but that uh, he and Tyler Smith uh, today just on the side work in resistance cords with the training staff but I saw that as a a positive that uh, Dono uh, may be getting closer to getting back and then also too a couple other things I took from the press conference was how um, well Mike McCarthy spoke of Marquise Bell and of Edoga and so when you start looking at the injuries that we're talking about you say to yourself yeah they I think right now given that the way those two gentlemen played that you could expect that maybe they're comfortable with them moving forward if these guys are not ready to go. If they're especially with hamstrings, we've talked about it, they can be lingering. Yeah. So why rush it if you've seen good performance from those guys already? Yeah, and it sounds like Tyler Smith that it, it may take a little more time because there was yeah. no promise that he's taking full part tomorrow. He but said he's a little yeah. behind. Uh, yeah, Dono. he said that Dono had kind of the the lead, if you will, and and who's closer to getting back mm-hmm. and. Um, it's just so interesting, too, because with Tyler Smith still being a bit of a question mark and then Chuma Udoga, we don't – do we know what, what happened to him in the game, Christy? Were you, Adoga, were you right Adoga just got poked in the eye. Yeah. There you he, go. he missed a couple of plays. He went back in. But then the next series is when they went with the younger guys. That was in the fourth quarter when to they turned it over to the backup. So T.J. Bass okay. went back in, and then you had that's when Awesome Richards uh, replaced Tyron Smith at left tackle. Awesome, awesome. And what I wanted to mention about that, um, Aisha, I'm going to defer to you for this one. After you went back and you've watched this game, I'm assuming multiple times at this point, <laughs> yes. uh, for your film study, what have you noticed from from Chuma Hidoga and how he's playing in this position, given if he has to play again this weekend. What are some of the things that, you know, Mike McCarthy mentioned he can get even better with a full week of practice? What are some of those things that you noticed that he could improve on, but also some things he did well? Well, yeah, well, one thing that worried me about Chuma at left tackle from training camp, which is uh, the footwork. And when you get into a guard, that minimizes some of that. You're in a phone booth. It's smaller. It's a smaller workspace. But I thought he handled power really well. Um, he, there were some slippage at certain points in time, but I thought he held his own pretty well. And also, too, in the run game, he did some good things, get into the second level, also pin it and pull in. If you look at that big uh, run by TP, uh, the 25-yarder, he pulls around and he seals off the, the gentleman so he can make that cut. And so I just saw some good things with his movement. And, um, yeah, like I said, encouraging play. And I think it's more than enough to get you through because that interior that you just saw is one of the best you're going to see. This interior also is one of the best you're going to see. <laughs> so he's he, he getting a lot of practice. But he getting a lot of practice. You understand? I was going to say, speaking of one of the best where we're going to see, Aisha's film study uh, never disappoints. We'd love to <laughs> see it um what else i wanted to mention uh something else i want to mention rather is brandon cooks right and when you saw his name pop up on the practice report 
a little bit of panic kind of surges through your body because it is so early and all of that. Mike McCarthy talking about it a little bit more in the press conference. He said it did happen during the game. Now, what was interesting is, again, you have this constant rotation of receivers in this room between veteran and younger guys that can come in and kind of alleviate. And we've talked about this before. It, it extends the long, longevity of everybody's season when you're able to do that. Um, what I wanted to ask you guys both is there was no indication really that Brandon Cooks was dealing with anything from what well, we well, saw. He, he came over to the sideline and he was talking with the athletic trainers, but he never sat on the bench and was uh, attended to by the uh, athletic trainers of the team physicians and never went into uh, the blue tent. I think that he went back in the game. Um, but remember, this was like later in the second half. And so, honestly, a lot of the guys weren't going back in because, if mm. you recall, with a 40 to nothing lead, How uh, the, the, that? The, the end of that game <laughs> looks like a preseason game where it was the young guys out there mm -hmm. uh, getting, getting the reps as much as and possible. And this is why we love Christy in That's here important. because, again, on the broadcast version of it, you can't really see all those things. And so, I'm so glad uh, you bring that up. Um, Aisha, what I wanted to ask you was, you know, we you pointed it out that Mark Lane um, tweeted this, and, and Mark Lane, I messaged him to get his title correct on here. I don't want to mess it up. Mark worked with the Texans Wire in USA Today um, covering the Texans. He had tweeted out that Brandon Cooks is a guy that would take some veteran days off when he was with the Texans. Again, you're talking about a guy that you, you forget how seasoned he is uh, when it comes to his time <laughs> in the NFL, right? And well, so let, let, Let's take the temperature tomorrow tomorrow after yeah. a full practice he's yeah. Brandon Cooks will still be on the report tomorrow yeah. if he's a DNP did not practice then then okay let's you let's can, let's start to worry turn up the panic a little yeah. bit yeah uh-huh but well, for 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 a thing again if he's limited or you know uh, if it's a DNP, I'll be worried. If it's limited, I'll feel much better going into Sunday. Absolutely, and that's why I wanted to kick off this first block talking about this because, again, bottom line, no need to panic uh, just yet. And, again, Brandon Cooks is a guy that all of these players and coaches alike have praised nonstop of how he takes care of his body. Exactly. So if anybody knows his body well enough to understand when he should, you know, kind of take a step back or if something's sore kind of nagging him – it's Brandon Cooks. Brandon mm -hmm. Cooks does nothing but preach of how to take care of your body to these young guys. There's a reason he's still playing at the level he plays 10 years in. There's a reason he's so fast 10 years in. It's because he takes care of his body nonstop, something we've just heard echoed over and over yeah. from really everybody. Kevontae Turpin, mm -hmm. Michael Gallup, Jalen Tolber, I mean, Jalen Brooks, all of these guys will tell you nonstop. First thing you ask them about Brandon Cooks, oh, man, he tells me how to take care of my body. He tells me how to eat right. I'm not worried about it yet. Well, it, selfishly, I want to see him go against Sauce Gardner, there you who go. was uh, off, uh, defensive uh, rookie of the year last year, the outstanding Jets cornerback. And um, it was uh, it was Troy Aikman that pointed out um, Monday Night Football that the Jets, the way they usually play, they play sides. You know, mm -hmm. they don't take their top guy and necessarily have them follow the top receiver around. So um, if the Jets continue to do that, then that means we'll get to see Sauce Gardner go against everybody, against CD, against Brandon, against Gallup. So that's going to be fun to watch. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get into more of those key matchups um, as this – podcast continues on as we get later into our show real quick if you have any questions you can always text us at 817-290-3298 and when i mean always i mean now until 4 45 central time when this podcast ends uh then we will not be available to answer questions but until then text us your questions let us know what you want to really talk about in terms of sunday's game against the jets uh already into week two mode Let's go ahead and take our first break so we can just jump right into that. When we come back, we're talking key matchups, starting with the Jets' defense. How much of a threat do they actually pose to the Dallas Cowboys offense? We're getting into it and more. This is Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys, and we'll be right back. We know that juicy, cheesy, grilled-to-perfection burger sounds amazing, but it does sound like something is missing. Pepsi, baby. The yin to this burger's yang. Burgers and Pepsi go together like, well, like burgers and Pepsi. This perfect blending of flavors makes every bite of lettuce, every sesame seed on the bun, and every sip of that crisp, refreshing, ice-cold cola. A journey to Foodopia. Burgers. Better with Pepsi. That's what I like. At Jigsaw Dating, we obviously want the Cowboys to bring that sixth ring home. But to be honest, we're more focused on finding the person who will put a ring on your finger. 
That's why we created a dating app that reveals your face through meaningful conversation so you can date deeper. Because it's personality that matters the most, not looks. Join Jigsaw Dating today, dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Back to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. We're getting into all things key matchups with your Dallas Cowboys and the New York Jets in this segment. But first, check out the latest and greatest addition to tours at AT&T Stadium and at the Star in Frisco. Meet Jerry Jones, an interactive experience. Get a peek behind the curtain into the fascinating life of Jerry Jones with a focus on innovative fan experience in partnership with AT&T. This interactive technology gives tour goers the opportunity to ask Mr. Jones of variety of questions and for more information and to book your tour you can visit dallascowboys.com slash tours there okay ladies let's talk a little bit jets defense um i'm looking at their practice report right now and there's no defensive player on there for today for what they reported uh you have two o-line guys um and then you have Brees hall who you just who you were just uh, going to talk about christy uh they're in the running back situation um all limited so Again, nothing really on the Jet side of things to look at as far as injuries get, um, but I'm not sure if they had an actual practice. Um, oh, walkthrough. They had a walkthrough Yeah, today. short week for so, them coming off go. a Monday night game. Mm-hmm. There you mm-hmm. go. So let's get into it because, again, the talk of this Jets team was obviously the situation with Aaron Rodgers uh, going down, officially out for the rest of the season. However... The other conversation was how they rallied to come back. They really played until the end of that game to win in overtime uh, against the Bills as well. So let's get into it on the defensive side of the ball because I think that's where a lot of conversation should go towards first. We'll we'll switch sides because we know uh, kind of what the Cowboys defense can do and is capable of. But let's start with the Jets defense against the Cowboys offense. Aisha, our film study gal, what is... What are some of the key matchups, key things, anything really that we can kick off this conversation with that you notice right off the bat? Well, there's similarities. Um, I think Mike McCarthy actually said it today in his press conference. He said this defensive line depth is one of the best we'll see. And that's one of the things that, um, that's one of the things that the Cowboys have at their disposal because you even saw in this past game that they put their second string defensive line out there and they were dominant also. So the Jets also have that luxury. They have obviously they have Quentin Williams, um, F- John Franklin Myers, Lord uh, <laughs> Quentin Jefferson, Will McDonald, who's a guy that I was very high on coming out of the draft. And so they can give you uh, give you defensive fronts and ways. But one of the biggest things I noticed was their spacing as a defense and I think that it really dictates a lot of what they're able to do they line their defensive linemen well they line their defensive ends out so wide and that's because they're trying to funnel you or basically force you to run the ball inside because that is their strength right so I think the Cowboys are going to have opportunities to run at the edges um, to to take advantage of their spacing because they space they they kind of spread things out so their playmakers can make plays and they play a lot of zone too which is something I noticed they're 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 not exotic like wink where they're doing a lot of different fronts they're trying to disguise I don't, things. I don't think they have to be they, and that's <laughs> they a great, don't have to be that's a great point by Christy yes they don't have to be um this throwing all these different things at you one thing I will say is that the Cow- Cowboys offensive line is going to have to be ready to deal with uh the blitzing because when they blitz, they are successful because they have the opportunity to rush forward and still get pressure. So I think there will be opportunities there in the secondary. Dak is very good against zone, um, and we'll, we'll see how things fare. But those are just some of the things I noticed um, right away looking at them. Um, and they also tackle very well, too. So yeah. you're going to have to try to get yak opportunities out there as well. Yeah, I well, love that. Christy, mm-hmm. I wanted to defer to you on this one. Aisha's talking about the Jets secondary. Jordan Whitehead is a guy that I know you wanted to talk about mm-hmm. specifically in this segment and you know the three interceptions that he had just absolutely bullying Josh Allen uh, during that Monday night game let's talk about that because you have a little interesting nugget as you do uh, every time we come on this podcast I'm just amazed at how Christie's brain works what is your nugget for the day on Jordan Whitehead 
and what we should know about it. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of folks heard uh, or read on social media, and then it was picked up in national media about his three interceptions that he hit the season-long incentive, a bonus. Uh, if he had three interceptions this year, in his contract there was a clause where he would make $250,000. Didn't take him the season. He did it on Monday night. Okay, so $250,000 extra. Congratulations, Jordan. That's awesome. But I wanted to talk about um, some of the Cowboys who also have incentives in their contracts. So, for example, Stephon Gilmore, who had an interception for uh, the Cowboys on uh, in Monday night's win. Was Steph um, Stephon, if he makes first team all NFL, he gets a $1 million bonus. Tater That's tops. in his contract. Wow. If he plays 70% of defensive snaps, $250,000. If he hits 80% of defensive snaps, that's another $250,000, so that'd be $500,000. If he plays 90% of defensive snaps, this is over the course of the whole season, $500,000 added to the two fifty, the two fifty, so a $1 million. So... Um, the, for example, Dak Prescott has one. If he plays 50% of offensive snaps and the Cowboys get a Super Bowl win, he gets a million-dollar bonus. Uh, Malik Hooker, with his new contract, if he has five interceptions this season and the Cowboys make the playoffs, he gets an extra $500,000. If he plays in 85% of defensive snaps and the Cowboys make this, makes the playoff, they make the playoffs. That's an extra half million dollars. Goodness. But there's one thing: there there aren't too many players. This this is this year we have a lot more incentive laden contracts than we've had in previous years. That's because when you're bringing in guys like Stephon Gilmore, or when you're re-signing a veteran like Malik Hooker, or when you have Tyron Smith restructuring his contract, Tyron took basically um, gave back some money uh, to in restructuring, but if he plays 50%, 60%, 70% of snaps, he'll get million dollar incentives for playing time. But here's the important thing to know about, um, there are two kinds of bonuses, likely to be earned and not likely to be earned. If it's a likely to be earned incentive, like guys have per game active bonuses, uh, you assume that guys are gonna be able to play. That money counts against your salary cap this year. But these less likely or not likely to be earned, like Malik getting five interceptions, that would count against next year's cap. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But it's something that Jerry Jones would love to pay. He would love to pay Dak Prescott a million-dollar bonus because it means we've won the Super Bowl yeah. and Dak has played at least 50% of snaps. So, um, you know, it's very common to have per-game um, uh, active deals. So, for example, Leighton Van Der Esch, his per-game active bonus is $29,411. $29, so he was active on in the first game. Mm -hmm. He got that. But that's accounted for in the salary cap. But Jordan Lewis, who also gets in his contract right. $29,411 if he's active in a game, well, guess what? He wasn't active mm. in that game uh, last Sunday, yeah. week one, because of his injury. And so coming as he's working back from the foot injury, so he doesn't get that. So, That's insane. Yeah. Christy, so, so, so you, have, you, you have to play. So, like, for example, uh, let me let me pick a player, and then I'm going to have you guys play. Uh, oh, I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you play. He's <laughs> just face right now. I, I'm a little shook. Like, <laughs> no, I'll be, no, be watching their money like that. The comp, the the complications, I guess, not complications, that's not a great word for it, but the complexities that go into these contracts. Um, that's well, a great point. No, let, let's let's use a veteran because we're talking about okay. guys who are in the league and you bring them in in free agency. And so these aren't necessarily part of, sure. you know, part of a standard rookie contract. They're sure. not. Dante Fowler. Okay. All Dante right. Fowler, who is part of the defensive oh, line gee. rotation. And uh, <laughs> if you were, if you were Dante's uh, agent, Aisha, what would you look for in terms of number of sacks? He has a certain number that if he reaches it this year, he's mm. going to get uh, $500,000 if he reaches this number and the Cowboys make the playoffs. How many sacks? I can't remember how many he had last year, but he, I got he, you. I, I would say 
Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Okay. I think that's fair. That's that's all right. You think that's fair because uh, because Jess, you well, are Jerry season? and Stephen Jones. All season, you're right? Jerry and Stephen Jones. La last last year, he had six sacks, but he only played thirty percent of defensive snaps. So you so well, I, I use, uh, Aisha wants eight. Yeah. You are um, Jerry Jones and Stephen Jones, that's and you're managing the salary cap. Oh so my what gosh. would you have? I would be panicking if that was my job. I'd have panic attacks nonstop. <laughs> um. I'm gonna say I'm gonna go seven. I think that's fair. Okay. No, I'm gonna go eight. It, I'm it, gonna go eight. You guys nailed it. You are the perfect agent, Aisha, it, it, and you are the perfect the person salary you, cap manager you. there, Jess. Oh, yeah, so Dante Fowler, eight <laughs> sacks in a playoff berth, half a million dollars. Yeah. Dante Fowler, ten sacks. If he goes even more, ten sacks and a playoff berth, one million dollars. And the way he looked yet uh, last week, he's flying off that line of scrimmage. So. Hey, if, if they play the Giants line every week, Jerry's going to pay a bunch of money. Yeah, he's going to be handed it out. <laughs> we just Real quick, about. too, something <laughs> – look, and I'm sure that's money that he doesn't mind, right? Um, that means they're winning, they're playing well. Something I wanted to make sure to mention – Christy, thank you. That was – I love learning from you. I feel like we learn something every sorry, time. I'm sorry, we, we kind of went down in the weeds that's there. Okay. But, but the important thing is that you have to account – you have yeah. to budget for these things. Yeah. And you hope that they happen, but it means that you pay the piper next year. Mm, that makes sense. Um, real quick, I want to go back to this Jets defense because I uh, was writing some notes. Something that I noticed, and I went back and I watched today because I was watching the game, and then I, I was writing notes as I was watching the game, and then Aaron Rodgers, everything happened there, and I kind of was like, wait, am I actually seeing things as they are? Am I kind of still shell-shocked from that happening? When we rewatch some stuff today, um, Aisha, I'm going to go back to you for this. Is it just me or did the Jets defense struggle with completing tackles? And I only say this because Dan Quinn had pointed it out uh, about his goal for this last game, Sunday's game against the Giants, was that he really wanted the guys to complete the tackles. Um, and he said they only missed two tackles during the game. Uh, last week, which is a good number to start on. Of course, I'm talking about the Cowboys defense. Got me thinking about the Jets defense um, because this is a highly ranked defense that we're talking about here. Is that something you noticed as well, is that they kind of struggle with completing tackles uh, all the way through when you went back and watched the film? Oh, I actually think that they're a pretty, pretty good tackling team. I feel like they did have some sure tackles. But I will say, again, with the sp like you talked about it, is like they're not playing man a lot. Mm. They're not playing man a lot. They're not. So they're secondary. If you get those guys out, you just got to make one guy miss with them, and there's going to be space. That's how I look at it. And also, too, with their defensive line, you want to run these guys. You want to yeah. get them out of space. You're not yeah. going to beat them with power. So to your point, I, I think that that's going to happen on both sides of the ball. Like the Cowboys are going to have to tackle well, but they also oh, are going to yeah. have to tackle well because I know the Cowboys will be looking to run that front seven and get them going sideline to sideline. Yeah. DJ Reed had mm -hmm. 11 total tackles mm -hmm. uh, against the Bills last week. Quincy Williams, 10. Uh, CJ Mosley had seven. Mm -hmm. um, as far as sacks go, let's see. I'm going to pull this up right now. Uh, Quinn had Jefferson five, yeah. had two sacks. Uh, Jameer Johnson had one. Al Woods had one. John Franklin Myers had one. And then I believe that accounts for all five there. So... As far as what the Cowboys offensive line needs to do, ladies, mm -hmm. in order to continue to work on that pass protection, that's something that they've emphasized for weeks now is that they want to make sure that pass pro is short up. They want to make sure that Dak Prescott has time to release the ball, given he wants that release time to be quick as well. What does this Cowboys offensive line need to do, Christy, in order to really make sure that, one, Dak Prescott is avoiding a five sack game and two to ensure that you know guys like Chumri Doga there's not a drop off really on any side of the line that they're going to be working against yeah in the well an interesting note was in week one that Dak had the most time to pass in the pocket of any NFL quarterback 2.11 seconds that's an eternity in the NFL and it's a tribute to the Cowboys offensive line and, and also throw in the backs and the tight ends who help with pass protection as well so um, I, I think that's important. Um, with the Chuma Adoga, I think that it's interesting that he knows 
what it's like to go against these Jets defensive linemen because he used to do it every day in practice. Absolutely. He there is a go. Jets draft pick. Now, he spent last year in Atlanta, and uh, his two starts were at guard. He played two games at, at guard, but he actually came in as a, as a tackle out of USC. And, in fact, when the Jets uh, drafted him in 2019, they made a trade with the Vikings so that they could move up a spot and make sure that they got uh, Adoga in round three. And his rookie year, he actually started eight uh, times at right tackle for the Jets. So he knows what it's like to go against Quentin Williams. And by the way, uh, Quentin Jefferson got the, the two sacks. And I'm so glad you mentioned him, Jess, because he's overshadowed when you play next to Quentin Williams. Mm -hmm. But Quentin Williams, uh, he may not be a name that's familiar to a lot of Cowboys fans who kind of focus on just the Cowboys in the NFC. But... Ninety-four million dollar player. I mean, he is one of he, he is he and Aaron Donald. I think you could uh, a lot of people would say Quinnen Williams is behind maybe only a couple people at tackle. Aaron Donald being one of them. Yeah, you mentioned um, you mentioned how the Cowboys got the ball out fast and just kind of how they ran things. I think is I think it should be a similar. Not a completely similar game plan, but doing similar things in that way. But I will say that once I with a ta with a team that tackles as well as the Jets does will do rather, and have the defensive line that they have. When you look at the Bills game, there were plenty of times you mentioned the running backs and stuff and stuff like that. When you look at the Bills, there was not a third option. It wasn't it wasn't an outlet guy there for um, the the quarterback to just dump the ball off to. He was looking downfield this whole time with all that pressure coming. So with the Cowboys, we saw this past this past game that there's a there's a um, someone in the flats, there's an intermediate part person and then there's someone in the, there's someone on every level. There's a passing option on every level and I think that's going to be important because the Jets took advantage of that with the Bills and that's why uh, Josh Josh Allen struggled a lot. And just like we talked about the quick game screens tiring these guys out with getting them on the move as mm -hmm. opposed to trying to play power with power because that typically doesn't work with this defensive line. And and I'm glad you brought that up too because we can already hear the storylines just starting to uproar of Josh Allen and the interceptions and oh no, the Cowboys are playing the Jets this week. Automatically we know where that storyline is going to go without even having to say it. How, Christy, I'm gonna, we can bounce around on this based on what I saw and all, all three of us really have seen. How can the receivers continue to create the separation needed in order to avoid that? And is that something that you guys noticed both in this first game as far as separation that they were creating that maybe wasn't the case last season and how they've shored that aspect up of, of the game to help Dak Prescott? Because we know it wasn't just a Dak Prescott issue. We know that. We've talked about that. That's beating a dead horse. But as far as what the receivers have done to grow and really build over this offseason to help avoid that, what did you guys notice in this week one matchup and how that played a big factor yeah, in well, everything? Given we're in a rain game, right? It was a yeah, rain game yeah, that's the thing. Everything still. was kind of toned down uh, or some of the options were lesser off the table because of the rain situation. But in terms of, like Aisha says, with them playing zone, that means like you're not up in man press coverage, you mm -hmm. know, like – taking guys off, you know, like right at the line yes, on the wide receivers trying to do that press, press coverage. The other thing is when you're in a zone, um, that means you're playing back mm -hmm. and you're seeing – the quarterback, you're watching the quarterback as well as the guys who are coming into your area. And so a lot of times that, I want to say it makes it easier for interceptions, but when you're playing man, your head's turned and you're not looking back towards the quarterback until the receiver turns or maybe puts his hands up, uh, you know, like the ball is coming to him. And so it, it's, it's a very different dynamic for uh, a cornerback to be – you know, in, in man and, and in a zone. So I think you have to be real – you always have to be careful with the ball as a, as a quarterback, but it's just different because in a zone the defensive backs are watching you. Yeah, I, I to answer your question, I, I do think it's going to be really contingent on, on the game plan mm -hmm. and what uh, Mike McCarthy and Brian Schottenheimer decide to do to beat their zone. Like we talked about, though, it's not super exotic because they, they're depending on – they bank on the fact that their um their front four is going to get home yeah. and make things easier yeah. for them however 
if there is a quarterback that has time back there, if there is a quarterback that is methodical, a la Dak Prescott, then I definitely do think that there will be opportunity there for them to take advantage of that zone. Zone can be great, but it can be hurtful if you do have a quarterback that understands it well. And if you're banking on your defensive line to make to get pressure, and that maybe doesn't happen as quickly as maybe mm -hmm. they're used to, there should be opportunities there for the Cowboys to take advantage. So, yeah, we saw a lot of man beaters in the in the first game because mm. they the Giants did play a lot more man. I don't know why, but they did. They played <laughs> a lot more man than what I expected. And so, but I will say also too, going back and looking at Sauce Gardner, I know you're excited to see mm -hmm. the matchup. There are some similarities in what I, I saw. Um, Stephon Diggs have some success against him, um, against the Bills. Even if he wasn't getting the ball, he was open mm -hmm. quite a bit of times. You know, still young player. He's still learning. Like mm -hmm. we've seen with Trayvon Diggs, there might be some opportunities for CeeDee Lamb to take advantage of that young, younger corner. But mm -hmm. also, also, there is um, – there's – Oh, barnacles, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, that's that's that something amazing. that I'm looking for. Yeah. That's an amazing train of thought. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and transition. Um, in the meantime, you can text us your questions at 817-290-3298. Uh, we're going to take our next break, and when we come, come back, we're going to talk about the Cowboys' defense, yeah. what a feeding frenzy they can have um, if they continue to play like they did in week one. We're going to talk all about it. This is Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. We'll be right back. At Jigsaw Dating, we obviously want the Cowboys to bring that sixth ring home. But to be honest, we're more focused on finding the person who will put a ring on your finger. That's why we created a dating app that reveals your face through meaningful conversation, so you can date deeper. Because it's personality that matters the most, not looks. Join Jigsaw Dating today, dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. You know that sound anywhere. It's the crisp crunch of that first nacho chip. With its perfect cheese to sour cream ratio sitting atop a layer of delicious beans, it's a sip away from perfection. That's what we're looking for. Add a delicious, refreshing Pepsi and we've achieved absolute nacho nirvana. Because while you can pile those nachos high with every spicy, cheesy, savory topping, there's no topping a cool Pepsi finish. Nachos, better with Pepsi. That's what I like. Welcome back to Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. We're going to talk all about the Cowboys' defense and uh, what that means for the Jets' offense. But first, head to the Pro Shop at Arlington Parks Mall in Arlington, Texas, on Saturday, September 23rd, between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. for Cowboys Collections on Tour. See rare team archives, customize hatware, grab a gift with purchase, and enter for a chance to win a giveaway. Stay tuned for more tour stops coming throughout the season. Ooh, that sounds fun. Um, my parents would love that. <laughs> um, okay, ladies, let's get right into it. Dallas Cowboys defense, the talk of the town, the talk of the NFL uh, right now, and really excited to see this defense play in not a rain game. Um, I'm, I'm excited for the whole team, but specifically what this defense can do um, when they're going against a full force Jets offense. Um, even with Zach Wilson in the pocket. And we'll get into that and why this isn't a game that you can really let off the brakes, right? It's it's all full steam ahead. There's no letting up even if, with Zach Wilson there, um, not seeing Aaron Rodgers. However, um, let's go into this. Aisha, we'll start with you. When talking in terms of Zach Wilson, now that you went back and you watched a little bit more, what kind of threat does he pose to opposing defenses when he is playing? And given he's still learning, there's still a lot, but again, you just can't count anybody out in this league. There's a reason they're in the NFL. He's now their guy, right? But what are some things that you saw that he could consider a strength in his game? Oh, he, I mean, he gonna run. Whether you look yeah. at that as a good thing or a bad thing, he's going to run. He's he's probably going to have to, honestly, because you know their tackle position. You just said that there were two tackles on the yeah. on the mm -hmm. injury report. Mm -hmm. That is where they're indeed the weakest. First of all, I was laughing also too because Connor McGovern playing center for them is hilarious. Why do people yeah. keep taking the people that we have as we had as guards and making them centers? That's funny to me, huh? Yeah, different guy, Connor McGovern. No. 
Connor no, McGovern played here? Same there, guy, same guy. No, I believe there are two Connor McGoverns. Oh. We'll double check on that. Wait, well, what? Go. It's a totally different human? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Barnacles. Imagine having a name twin like that. Because I was looking at those. The, the, there the, are two. Yeah, okay, two thank you. Guy. Thank you, Christy. Because uh -huh. I was like, how did they take another center of the Cowboys and make them, another guard and make them? My bad. Anyway, but I was looking at the, uh, yeah, the, their tackle position is where they've been attacked, like, mm -hmm. heavily, mm -hmm. and they struggle there. So um, I'm... I'm looking at, but also, too, as far as uh, Zach Wilson, yeah, he's going to run the ball. He's going to probably have opportunities to run the ball. I don't know if they design anything yeah, for him. I think but they he's, will. They I think might, it will be. Yeah, because they, they're, if I'm looking at the Cowboys last week, we talked about it yesterday, why would you try to pass if you had to? Like, unless you yeah. absolutely have to. Their teams are going to try to go heavy on their run, whether it's RPO, run action, whatever the case may be, try to get some passing out of that. But I expect for them to come out here with Brees Hall, who I know you're so excited oh, to talk about, oh, and great. Dalvin Cook, <laughs> and really try to take it to the Cowboys as far as running the ball with sprinkling and some movement from Zach Wilson. Yeah, I think the, I think the movement – if. It, my guess would be it would be by design. And mm -hmm. I don't mean running like quarterback draws or, you know, designing quarterback run plays, but have him on the move in, in terms of like rolling the pocket and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, and get getting him to move. So you pull up, definitely not the same this Connor McGovern. This is definitely not the same Connor yeah. McGovern. Yeah, there, there are two. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's, very, it's very confusing because they came in, I think, at the same they time. They did the and same year. Both, they both play offensive line, and so it's very confusing. But, but our our Connor, you know, is uh, from uh, Penn State, and uh, anyway, different guy. Anyway, okay. So I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at that. I'm laughing at like I don't know what I was expecting. You should have shown me. I'm sorry. And With the Boogie Nights uh, mustache it's a great, there, it was a great mustache. <laughs> it's a nice yeah. Shout out to yeah. Carter McGovern yeah. Uh, yeah. for the mustache. Yeah, uh, but Brees Hall, I'm I'm so glad that you guys mentioned him because. Uh, he was actually last year the second round pick of the New York Jets, but he was the first overall running back taken in the draft last year. And unfortunately, his uh, year was cut short. He only played in seven games because he had the knee injury, the torn ACL mm -hmm. in week seven. But guy out of Iowa State. And just to put Brees Hall in perspective, you saw him uh, rip that 83-yard run uh, on his second carry of the game Monday night. And his first run was 26 yards. So he ended up averaging over 12 and a half yards per carry <laughs> on Monday night in his first game back since the ACL injury. He only played 30% of the snaps on Monday night. But here's this is to put it in perspective. He's only played eight NFL games in his career. He's averaging over seven and a half yards every time he touches the ball. Does that seem high? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because it is. It's the most in NFL history, higher in through eight games played, higher than Adrian Peterson, higher than Bo Jackson, higher than Herschel Walker, higher than Billy Sims. I mean, so this guy is uh, what a – he's just tearing up the league, uh, you know, with just eight games played. But – uh, and he also can catch the ball out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. So in terms of um, – scrimmage yards uh, about 100 yards a game so I mean he's just he's amazing and uh, and if you don't hand it to him you hand it to Dalvin Cook although Dalvin actually yeah. did better catching the ball Monday night he had uh, he was three for three uh, targeted three times and caught yards. all three so uh, wow what a one-two punch there at running back and also being able to get it to him uh, out in the flat if you're getting a lot of pressure yeah something I wanted to mention is I'm looking at these stats and they didn't have any rushing touchdowns uh, during this game, the Jets, they only had one receiving touchdown. Oh, but one of the great ones of the season. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, something I didn't realize is Greg Zerloin, as uh, you guys mm -hmm. may or may not remember, is their kicker. And that is the same guy. Uh, that one is, <laughs> I was going to say, Chris, <laughs> not to be mistaken with Greg the leg. Same guy. My bad, um, yeah. he put, <laughs> No, you're good. He put 10 points on the board uh, for the Jets, three field goals, one extra point. Um, to me, when I'm looking at this game and given, look, pieces were, were falling together for this team, uh, after the Aaron Rodgers injury, we know you're not going to see the same kind of team. They have a whole week to prepare, uh, for this game, given it's a travel game for them coming to AT&T stadium to me, 
the way special teams has been playing uh, for the Cowboys and the way that they have shifted the conversation to become an important aspect of, you, you don't really talk about special teams a lot, right? Unless something big happens. Unless it's our podcast. Unless it's our, <laughs> we appreciate special teams here on Girls Talk, Boys Talk. But something that I want to make mention of is it will be very interesting to see um, – how Wanya Thomas, C.J. Goodwin, Noah Igbenogany, that dynamic threat can really attack somebody like Greg Zerloin, who has worked under John Fossil before, and how John Fossil knows his mechanics of kicking. Because, Christy, like we talked about, there's so many mechanics and timing things that go into being a good kicker. Greg Zerloin working under John Fossil, maybe there's a little history there that you go back and you're like, oh, I remember he could do this, and he was prone to doing this, to where your special teams unit can kind of attack that a little bit. I'm yeah. interested to see that aspect of the game yeah. when I look at things. I, I think you're right. And you mentioned having two offensive linemen on the injury report. And now they'll probably play, you know, it's their yeah. two starting tackles. And it was but, also a walkthrough but, for them. And, and it, well. it was a walkthrough. But anytime you have like an injury situation along the offensive line, remember those guys block for field goals and extra points. So there could be some vulnerabilities mm -hmm. along the, the offensive line there. But, you know, yesterday in terms of special teams, we were talking talking about Xavier Gibson from Dallas Woodrow Wilson High School and from Stephen F. Austin there in Nacogdoches in East Texas. But he's the one that had the punt return touchdown uh, in overtime, only the it's third beautiful. time in NFL history for a punt return touchdown in overtime. But um, he was actually named AFC Special Teams Player of the Week today. So congratulations to him. But I, I do want to talk to Brian Anger, the Cowboys punter, yeah. uh, either today or tomorrow in the locker room or hopefully pregame if I don't get to talk to him during the week. But, you know, you're going to do directional punting anyway. But it be interesting to see the game plan on that. Yeah. The, the good news is with it being a home game and, you know, a, a controlled environment – and Brandon Aubrey just banged every kickoff through the yep. back of the end zone anyway. So you can you can take those guys out of the game on kickoff return by just putting it through the back of the end zone. But yep. but punts could be very fun on Sunday. On both sides of the ball. Exactly. On exactly. both sides. I just did a, a story on Cavante Turpin this morning, um, which had me going back to the videos of the two uh, uh, homers that he had in, is uh, during the 2022 preseason against the Chargers. Chargers, yeah, that was out at SoFi. And I just got excited again. And so uh, <laughs> we talk about him a lot in here. But Aisha, what is something about special teams, offense in general, Cowboys defense? One more thing you want to mention. Don't give them something too good, though, because keep in mind, we have a full day tomorrow to talk about more key matchups. Yeah. But give them something like, let's tease this audience a little bit, something good. I'm I'm really thinking. I was looking at <laughs> y'all. Don't laugh. Well, first of all, the just like drafting from Iowa State. I just <laughs> noticed that because they have um, Will McDonald from Iowa State. Alan Lazard was from well, they ain't drafting, but they brought him in. He's from Iowa State. They got a lot of Iowa State humans over there. Anyway, I was just looking at how tall Lazard is, six five. I wonder if Trayvon Diggs takes him on, or how they decide to do that because his height, I think. Oh, who's with who's, the matchup with oh, Stefan? How tall is Stefan? Uh, let's let me see on on that. I just feel like that's a big. And Alan Lazard is their deep threat. He's one of their deep threats. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to figure out. You don't feel like that? Well, it's just that Garrett Wilson is who was AFC offensive. Uh, he was who was NFL offensive rookie of the year last year and had that amazing two yard touchdown catch mm -hmm. on Monday night. I mean, he's he's outstanding he's, yeah he's, he's arguably the best receiver in the league and so um it, if they if they do decide to trail someone you would you think know, it would be him but yeah, I was just I, I wondering know. what the height I, I was with wondering the height what the height difference, difference yeah, it matters with a six five six that's five I mean you're I, thinking about length you're thinking about like those things I'm like that. you know maybe yeah. Trayvon is more suited for that and then maybe you put a Gilmore so Gilmore is uh six foot and, yeah that's a uh, huge yeah, height difference and, but Trayvon's six one but he, so, he's still he's still he's long he's, he's, he's longer, longer and lanky he's, yeah, he's, he's kind of long so i was just sorry I, this is something i was looking at just but well, you know that's something go. that we can 
you know, kind of work on this yeah. week okay. and see yeah. if we can find out some info. Well, the okay. good news is is that we're heading to the locker room literally right now. Uh, so we're going to wrap things up a little bit early today just because, again, we want to make sure that we're getting you guys really good insight from the locker room, talking to some players about some key matchups that I know we still have notes on here. So we'll be back here same time, same place, 4 o'clock Central Time uh, here on Girls Talk, Boys Talk. Until then, have a great rest of your day for Jess, Christy, and Aisha. We'll see you tomorrow. Again, Girls Talk, Boys Talk, presented by Jigsaw, the preferred dating partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Have a great day. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?